successful last year uh, where we conducted our webinars, our workshops, plus our CLS activities on a large scale. And we were very um, privileged and honored uh, that we uh, received recognition not only at the state, but also at the national ISA conferences where we won awards in uh, various categories. So today is the first uh, webinar of this new team and it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce my uh, our new team who will be with you all for this whole year. Our Honorable Secretary, Dr. Parna Thakkar, who everybody knows very well. She is one of the most dynamic uh, anesthesiologists of the country. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Katkade sir, who's always been our mentor and guide. He's also our GC member and will be uh, representing our city at the state level. And we have Dr. Uh, Nilima Kelkar, who's our treasurer and a very hardworking person. And then there is Dr. Amrapali and Dr. Shamini, who are a part of our scientific team and who are a very enthusiastic lot. So we expect uh, to have a really wonderful year under them. Plus, our whole team is geared up with numerous activities and we already have a schedule made till, I think, the middle of next year. So we are all looking forward to having you join us in all of our activities. We seek your blessings and your guidance. And uh, please let us know if we are going wrong anywhere and encourage us like you've always done. Now I hand over to Dr. Parna Thakkar, who will be introducing the program uh, to all of us. Thank you, Manisha, for that kind and brief introduction. So let's get started. Good evening, all. On behalf of Thane ISA, I welcome each and every one of you, all the participants, all the speakers, the executive committee members, our SAMS president, Dr. Balaji Asegaukar, sir, our SAMS uh, secretary, honorary secretary, Dr. Rajesh Tagarpalle, sir, and the past uh, honorary secretary, Dr. Avinash Bosle, sir, who kindly joined and uh, uh, made the uh, program uh, you know, more successful. So uh, we'll start with this. Uh, 14 November, all over the world, it is celebrated as World Diabetes Day. And uh, it is also the birthday of Sir Frederick Banting, who discovered insulin. Month of November is the National Diabetes Month. And the main focus during this month is to create awareness about diabetes and prevent its complications. So let's celebrate World Diabetes Day before the month of November ends. Diabetes and diet are closely related and we will also have a small talk about di a diet today during our webinar to promote healthy lifestyle. 14 November in India is also celebrated as uh, Children's Day. It's the birthday of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru who loved children. At the end of the webinar, we will be playing the videos of uh, some healthy recipes which are uh, the videos which are uh, made by our uh, Thane ISA members. Also, we'll be playing the videos of our members' children and their grandchildren who are super achievers. So I'm very excited about this uni theme-based program. And it's the first program during our first webinar uh, during our tenure, new tenure. And... Um, we began with the celebration of World Anesthesia Day and after that, it's the first webinar. So let's get started. Dr. Amrapali Nayak, who's the consultant anesthesiologist at Jupiter Hospital, she'll be moderating the program. So over to you, Amrapali. Amrapali, you have to unmute yourself. Good evening, everyone. Uh, let me introduce you to Dr. Vijay Neglur. Uh, he's a director of Dr. Neglur Diabetes Speciality Clinic in Thane, consulting diabetologist at Jupiter Hospital Thane. He has many publications under his name. Over to you, sir. Thank Dr. you. Vijay. Thank you, Amrapali, for your kind words. Let me share my slide. I hope the slides are visible and I'm audible, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So we'll discuss today about uh, neo-anti-diabetic drugs as we mark the celebration 
of the World Diabetes Day. Before we come to the session, I reminded of an important incident, very interesting incident in a flight. And in the midst of the flight, the air hostess comes to an economy class and announces, is there any anesthetist on the board? There was a young anesthetist sitting. He was excited and he got up and said, anybody sick? Anybody ill? She said, yes, please follow me. So she took him from the economy class to the business class and stood next to the very famous cardiac surgeon. And the cardiac surgeon looked at that person and said, can you please adjust the light for me because I can't read my book properly. So that's how the anesthetist was used to adjust the light. I know they have been very helping, very hard, especially during the OT times and they do all kinds of odd jobs and they are so much important in seeing the surgery through and talking to them is also very interesting and very nice experience. So thank you once again. And I thank uh, the organizers of the Society of Maharashtra State Anesthesiologists, especially Dr. Amrapali, Dr. Manisha, Dr. Parna, Dr. Nilima, and of course my close friend, Dr. Sunil Katkade. So why it's important to, man to look at the management of diabetes, especially in the surgical setting. It's important because the length of the stay of these patients in the hospital is longer because of the dysglycemia. And it reminds you that it's most important complication that you get in diabetes and it's the seventh major cause of death. There are many drugs are involved in treatment of diabetes and its comorbid condition. And especially the patient also receiving insulin as for the complications of the treatment itself. Then patient requires most important post-operative and a critical care in patients of diabetes. And they undergo certain procedures and surgeries commonly seen in, not seen in non-diabetic patients and have increased mortality and morbidity rates. And surgical procedures result in the metabolic perturbations and hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia risk factor for the post-operative sepsis, endothelial dysfunction, cerebral ischemia, and impaired wound healing. What actually happens in the surgical stress is the stimulation of the counter-regulatory hormones, the catecholamines, the glucagon, cortisol, and the growth hormones. And the surge of these hormones have the effect on the pancreas in inhibiting the secretion of insulin. And of course, in, on the stimulation of the adipose tissue, which brings about increased lipolysis. That lipolysis flushes the fatty acids into liver and also because of the excess free fatty acids and decreased uptake of glucose by the peripheral skin, by the peripheral tissue, especially the muscle, the lactate levels go up, which go to liver, and liver desperately converts this lactate into various aspects of glucose, like gluconeogenesis, or does bring about glycogenolysis, there's an increased glycemia again. So therefore the patient has these problems of glycemia, which gets worsened, and that results into mitochondrial injury, endothelial dysfunction, immune dysregulation, and reactive oxygen species. So these are the problems that occur in the surgical case, and therefore uh, awareness of these problems, and therefore equipping oneself with the proper management is important to see the patient through the surgical procedure. And this is the publication which looks at the glycemic control as a strong predictor for the post-operative morbidity and mortality. And what this study says, that at the end of 30 days, the mortality is pretty high, and plus the increased incidence of the, of the causes of myocardial infarction, stroke, renal failure, and wound complications. So therefore, impaired control of sugar has these impact of the vascular catastrophes. And if we look at the patients who have diabetes or who has no diabetes, even with the stress hypoglycemia also, the patients have adverse events. The patient may not be diabetic, but because of the stress, the sugars go up, his A1C is normal. Even in those patients, the complications are pretty high. So therefore, controlling glycemia is of paramount importance. If we look at the guidelines by the American Diabetic Association in 2023, now the guideline looks at a different angle. It's more personalized than what it used to be, like everybody start metformin, then the first molecule, then add on the next molecule, and next it is not so anymore. What it says is the patient has established cardiovascular disease or there's increased incidence of a heart failure or a chronic kidney disease. We have a special molecule like GLP receptor agonist and the SGLT2 inhibitors as the drugs of choice 
ahead of other drugs, even if the patient's A1C is not controlled. Look at the change in the impact of treating patients with diabetes by the guideline. And here also, when the weight loss is a major concern, in fact, the American Diabetic Association meeting in this year, the June, had 60% of the presentations on the weight loss as the major emphasis on treatment of diabetes. And here you can see those drugs which have got a very highly efficacious like dulaglutide, semaglutide, and the combinations of GLP, GIP receptor agonists like tirzepatide, and of course the drugs like rutatretride. All these newer drugs have come in a big way and which has the effect on reducing the blood pressure. It also looks at the effect on reducing weight I mentioned, and also when the patient has the can't afford to buy drugs, then what happens in, in those patients who are poor, they can prescribe like sulfonylureas and glitazons. And this is the social determinant of the health, which is also looked at by the American Diabetic Association guidelines. Further this year, the guideline also redefines the stress on these four pillars. And the first, of course, as I mentioned earlier, to reduce the adiposopathy, which is again, most important impact. Second, to take care of the CV renal risk reduction. So it's a cardiometabolic and a renal reduction. Mental health and social determinants is also important. And now they added a most important metrics and that is time in range. You need to get your patient in range so that the 70% of the time patient is between 70 milligrams to 180 milligrams. If that is achieved by the patient, then patient gets all benefits of good glycemic control. So these are the new pillars which we are now looking at the patients of management of diabetes, which is called the person-centered approach. This is the latest approach that we have when look at the patient of diabetes. Now the problem is when you look at patients of diabetes and the treatments available, there's a plethora of drugs with different actions and there are multiple guidelines which tend to confuse people. And the conventional teaching is that during surgery or before anesthesia, we told all the drugs. And now there is again a different thought that you can continue some drugs and some drugs are beneficial and they have a beneficial effect on the patient's outcome. So let's look at all those intricacies and see what we can best uh, think of using these drugs intelligently in patients with diabetes undergoing surgery. So when you classify the anti-diabetic drugs, you classify them those who secrete insulin, or which is also called secretogogs, those who improve insulin resistance. And there are a lot of drugs which are there, like miscellaneous drugs, like AGIs, the amylin analogs, the dopamine agonist, and the sodium glucose transporter inhibitor. And the newest class is the GL preceptor agonist oral one, besides injectable, which is semaglutide, which is available in 3, 7, and 14 milligrams. We'll touch upon the important of um, important molecules and see how they are important in terms of the outcome of the patient who goes for surgery. So before we dive deep into that, an important aspect to remember that general anesthesia increases the cortisol level. And therefore, the sugars can go up by general anesthesia. While the spinal and epidural anesthesia has no effect on cortisol, and therefore the sugar may not be affected much. The spinal anesthesia decreases the catecholamine levels because of blockade of the sympathetic chain. And therefore, you get a minimal drop in the blood pressure, but no change in the blood sugar levels. This is a very important quote by a very important diabetologist. And he says the diabetologists have the more concern about hyperglycemia, while surgeons, nurses, and particularly anesthetists have understandable but often irrational fear of hypoglycemia. So this is how the dualities of interest, the cardiologists and diabetologists are more interested in treating hyperglycemia, whereas surgeons and anesthetists are more worried about hypoglycemia. So that's how sometimes there is a discrepancy in the thought process and therefore management of diabetes can be a little irrational. Let's begin with the first molecule. When we talk of new molecules, we should also think of the older one because they also have some kind of an impact on these patients' management and 50 to 60% of these patients taking these molecules as well. So talking about biguanides, which, come, which is the most important molecule is metformin, the sole molecule. It reduces the production of glucose by the liver. It will also action of the import in the transferring glucose by the glut force, especially in the adipose tissue in the muscle. 
It is the first line treatment until 2022. In 2023, as I showed you the guideline, the metformin was not there. On the previous time, all the guidelines did mention that metformin is the first drug of choice, but it's no more because there is no much evidence for metformin having superiority in terms of cardiovascular manifestation. Look at this study, which uses metformin in patients who have got undergoing ambulatory surgery. And what it says that the patient does not have hypoglycemia when you use this molecule. So it's wise to continue these molecules during surgery, which are the ambulatory surgery. For example, the cataract surgery or a minor surgery where patient can continue bigonides. There is no need to stop bigonides when the patient is taking surgery. So remember that bigonides should not be stopped in the minor surgery and therefore patient can continue with that. This is one study which looked at the patient with an impaired renal function. And these are 1 million patients which were studied and they had GFR of less than 30. So anybody who has GFR of less than 30, now we look more at GFR rather than creatine value because the GFR has got more impact in looking at the renal outcome. And therefore it's interesting to know that we look at GFR. I must remind you that in the past, the US FDA has given the guideline that anybody has creatine more than 1.6, you should stop it when the patient goes for surgery. It was realized when the patient stopped this molecule, the sugar started going up. And the patient filed the case against the US FDA, the first time in the history of US FDA. The patients filed the case against US FDA and they won the case. After that, now we're using the GFR as the cutoff values. Do not go by the, the creatine value, but go by the, the GFR. If it's less than 30, the risk of lactic acid is very high. Otherwise, the lactic acid does not occur if the GFR is more than 30. And why get lactic acidosis? Because the entire function of metformin is to prevent the lactate uptake from the liver. And what liver does is to convert the lactate into glucose. That is called Cori cycle. It was taught to us in the first MBBS physiology lecture. And what metformin does is stops that lactate being picked up by the liver. And therefore, lactate accumulates and therefore you get lactic acidosis. Simple explanation why I get lactic acidosis. And therefore, remember, those with poor GFR are only one we should not give the metformin and those patients should not be taken for surgery with the GFR less than 30 on metformin. Now, there's one interesting study, which is the retrospective cohort study looking at 91,000 patients who are about 20 years of age who went underwent surgery, any kind of surgery, a major surgery, all they mentioned here, skin, breast, musculoskeletal, respiratory, and so on and so forth. And what it was said is those patients who took metformin prior to surgery had a reduced mortality compared to those who are non-users. What does it mean? That metformin has many non-lysemic uh, benefits, which are important. So therefore, except the low GFR, you can continue metformin in all those patients because there's a lot of benefit effects. The next molecule is sulfonylurea. And we know that sulfonylurea works on the beta receptors. And what it does is it's, it closes the potassium channel acting on the receptor. When it closes the potassium channel, the calcium channel opens up. And as the calcium walks inside, it brings about exocytes of insulin. So insulin secretion is dependent on closure of potassium channel. And there are many kinds of sulfonylurea, the first generation, second generation. And the only problem with sulfonylurea is the hypoglycemia because it sits on this receptor and blocks the potassium channel. Until this sulfonylurea sits here and blocks the potassium channel, the secretion of insulin will continue. So it's not glucose dependent action, it's a glucose independent action, therefore the hypoglycemia is pretty high. And this is again a mechanism which shows that the cardiovascular events are pretty high because of this property of increased uh, hypoglycemic episodes, therefore ischemic reconditioning does not take place and therefore there's increased cardiovascular mortality. So therefore sulfonylureas are the drugs which have the bad name of causing cardiovascular events. And therefore there's also evidence showing that these are the patients who underwent monitoring the blood glucose using CGM. And what they showed was there is a hypoglycemic episode. The patient did not have symptoms. So asymptomatic hypoglycemia. And what you should remember is the conventional recommendation to withdraw sulfonylurea is very important appropriate during surgery, before surgery, you should withdraw sulfonylurea. TZD is another molecule which are also important and it acts through the PPAR gamma receptor. It acts on the nucleus, so it takes very long time. 
to have the full efficacy of this drug, it takes at least three to four weeks. But the point is concerned with surgery and anesthetics is that this drug can be used because it does not produce hypoglycemia. In all the minor surgeries, the patient can continue this elective surgery, patient can continue this molecule and go on for surgery without any problem. DPP-4 inhibitors are also very interesting molecules. And what they do is they block the enzyme DPP-4. And what DPP does is that it inactivates GLP, GIP, which is produced in the intestine after eating food. So when you eat food, the GLP, GIP is produced by the K and L cells respectively. And these incretin hormones have action on the beta cells and alpha cells. By beta cells, they stimulate secretion of insulin and alpha cells, they inhibit glucagon levels and therefore the blood sugar is reduced. The problem with GLP is it's immediately destroyed within two minutes by DPP-4. So if you give DPP inhibitor, you prolong the actions of GLP, GIP, and therefore you get a prolonged action of the GLP, GIP, and a good glycemic control. And these are the molecules we have, vildagliptin, citagliptin, saxalina, teniligliptin, alogliptin. There are many of these molecules. They're very useful. They're small molecules. They're very effective. And now what is very interesting is they can be used in the ICU. There are two dead studies which look at using linagliptin and citagliptin, both used in the ICU setting, where they compared the use of this molecule with basal insulin versus basal bolus therapy. You know, this is how the comparison is. And what it showed was that linagliptin and citagliptin in these patients, when used against basal bolus therapy, should showed a similar results without the risk of hypoglycemia. So, but these drugs now have stepped in the arena of treatment, even in the ICU, in the, in the critical care setting, you can use them because the initial teaching was all the oral drugs to be stopped, patient gets admitted in the hospital, is no more true. Talking about the SG altitude inhibitors, these are the drugs which work on the proximal tubule of the kidney, where the SG altitude transporters are there, this is called sodium glucose co-transporters, and this inhibit this. And therefore, the glucose, which is not excreted normally in the urine, starts getting excreted in the urine. By putting off the HCLT2 inhibitor in the pumps, the glucose is excreted. And that glucose, which is not absorbed back into circulation, that glycemic burden or a glucotoxicity on the beta cell is reduced. So it offloads the beta cell and improves the beta cell function and also reduces the weight of these patients, as I said, the adiposopathy is a very important factor in managing diabetes, and therefore, the inhibitors of this molecule become a big way. Now, what I must tell you is that these molecules have revolutionized the treatment of diabetes and even non-diabetic population. And the first study presented in 2015 at Sweden, at Stockholm, at the European Association Study of Diabetes, was a most interesting and most thrilling experience for all those who attended the meeting. And as the presentation was going on, people were so excited to see the benefit of the molecule. They started clapping continuously throughout the lecture. And some of them were super excited. They stood up on the chair and started clapping because these molecules have made a tremendous change in the outcome. For the first time, these molecules have shown benefit in heart failure, in prevention of heart failure. They also showed benefit in preventing kidney disease. And it's extended to the patients without diabetes with heart failure, without diabetic kidneys, and did, did a similar, a similar uh, miracle in these patients as well. Now, when you think of these drugs before surgery, what is the guideline says? The guideline says stop canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, empagliflozin three days prior to surgery, and stop ertogliflozin, which is not available in this country, four days prior to surgery. And why they so say so? Because the half-life of this molecule is 11 to 13 hours. And what you need to have the five half-lives as the duration before the drug is washed away from circulation. So therefore, classically, three to four days, the patient has to stop this molecule before the patient goes for surgery. And why it's important? Because if this molecule remains in the circulation, there's a risk of what is called a euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, which we had forgotten with using only in treating with type one diabetes. But this has resurged again or re-emerged again especially with this molecule, when the sugars are not very high, 250, that's why it's called euglycemic, pH is low, and they're low bicarbonates, and there's a huge anion gap of more than 12. And remember, the risk factors are any procedure going on more than one hour under general anesthesia, 
and patient has got anticipation of nil my mouth by 12 hours. Pre-op A1C is more than eight. Pre-op glucose more than 150. Patients taking insulin as outdoor patient and a significant background comorbid like trauma, myocardial infarction, et cetera. Remember, this is a possibility that the patient can get euglycemic ketoacidosis because ketogenesis is the basis of these molecules mechanism of action. If this exceeds, when you stop the insulin suddenly, there's an increased production of glucagon, which brings about lipolysis and therefore more ketone bodies, then you can get ketoacidosis. Ketosis is a normal procedure to process, but ketoacidosis is abnormal. And therefore, one has to remember this. So three to four days, you have to stop this molecule before the patient goes for surgery. Now, following that, there was an interesting study done recently in 2020 from Melbourne, which is called Journal of Perioperative Practice in Melbourne. And what they looked at, they looked at 82 number of patients, and 16 of them, they withheld the SGLT2 prior to the surgery, three to four days. And 66 patients, either the ignorance of a doctor or the patient's ignorance, these 66 patients continued the medication. And what did you see? And lo and behold, surprisingly, the patients who withheld the drug three to four days prior to surgery had more problems of post-operative complications and a reduced glycemic control. So there's a mixed approach now, mixed uh, feeling now. Of course, the study is too small to say anything. But as of now, till the fresh studies come up and fresh guidelines come up, it's important and important to remember that you to stop HGLT2 three days prior to surgery. The next molecule further is called GL preceptor agonist which was discovered accidentally by this great man called John Ng, who was working in Arizona in the people who came to him to a treatment of acute abdominal pain. He realized there were bites by this particular reptile, which is called Gila monster. It's pronounced the Gila monster. It's written as Gila monster, pronounced as Gila monster. And this Gila monster spit had a substance, which is called GL preceptor agonist. And now we have the analogs of this the exendin molecule described by him, and these, and these molecules, which are called human GLP analogs, and we have in the market dulaglutide, which we'll is once a week, then we have liraglutide, semaglutide, tirzapatide has not come to India still, but it is available in the Western countries. Now there's a study looking at using liraglutide prior to surgery compared with insulin therapy. These are 90 patients with 68 years of age in duration of diabetes of 10 to 14 years. And what they were given either liraglutide or insulin. And what you see here very carefully, in liraglutide and insulin, lira definitely scored over before surgery and at the end of surgery. You can see the sugar levels were much lesser in the liraglutide compared to insulin. Much more better, a much more efficacious insulin. This is just to remind you that these drugs, the HGL preceptor agonist, improve the beta cell function in just 24 hours. Can you believe that? There's no drug which can do like this, which improves the beta cell function within 24 hours. And these drugs have proved a quite miraculous molecules and they can see the effect yourself. And surgical patients are no exception for this benefit, which is called enhanced recovery after surgery protocols. And this is again an interesting, just to remind you in case, this is from the internet. And this is the 50 years old lady who has diabetes and obstructive apnea and hypertension. She scheduled for hysterectomy and she was on dulaglutide. This is a truly CT3 milligram, a higher dose. In India, we use up to 1.5, this is 3 milligram. She had other concomitant therapy, all like metformin, hydrochlorothiazide. And she fasted night before going for surgery. She was intubated and, it, and also the orogastric tube was put inside. Shortly before she was ready for extubation, she developed a large volume of emesis. This is how she vomited. And the vomited con con vomitus contained a substance which she had eaten a few days earlier. That means most of these patients are diabetes or gastroparesis as a part of autonomic disturbances. And these molecules further delay the gastric emptying. So it's important to be told this medication at least one week prior to the procedure. And remember, those patients who take oral GLP analogs, you can hold it for a day or two before surgery, but who take injectables or a weekly injectables, these are more powerful, though they are weekly, they're more powerful. You need to you need to stop these drugs at least a week or two prior to so this is the guideline by the American Society of Anesthesiology, and therefore 
the GL precept agonist have been stopped much earlier, irrespective of what is the indication, whether it's for diabetes or weight loss, or whatever the dose it is, and whatever the type and procedure that you're undertaking, you need to hold these drugs much ahead of time. So therefore, when you go for perioperative, GL precept agonist is held. When the patient is yes, no GI symptoms, you go proceed. When the patient has GI symptoms, you do an ultrasound and see the stomach is empty. If not, then if the stomach is empty, they go for the procedure. If it's not, then either delay the procedure or you can cancel the procedure or what is called a rapid sequence induction is possible. So therefore, remember a GL precept agonist, you need to withdraw this. In the last two or three minutes that I have, I'll quickly run through the insulin because though I was topic was given to me on oral drugs, but just in the interest of this completion of the subject, in just two or three minutes, I'll run through the insulin. Remember, all patients who admitted in the hospital, no oral drugs are normally recommended in the past. And all those critically ill patients will give intravenous insulin. And those patients who are eating food, you can give the basal bolus insulin. And all those guidelines, whether it's SAMBA guidelines, ADA guidelines, the American College of Physicians, all of them says that you have to act when the sugars go beyond 180. And we have many, many molecules for insulin that can be used. And whatever one you want to use, you can use it. You need a short-acting insulin. In the long-acting insulin, only NBH can be used. Glargine, Detimi, Deglude have not been tested in the ICU setting or in the intra in the hospital setting because of the their predictability of the action is not well known. So therefore, NPH you stick to is older molecule and any of these short acting molecule or regular insulin you can use. That's very important. This is the rabbit study which looked at the use of the uh, basal bolus insulin therapy. Here, of course, they use glargine therapy in this particular study called Labby two trial. And what it showed was that this is the better way of treating patients when they're hospitalized and not to use what is called sliding scale insulin. Most of the nursing homes and some of the uh, smaller nursing homes use the sliding scale insulin therapy, which is not correct because this is the post effecto mechanism of controlling sugar. They can bring about a lot of complications of diabetes and the cost of therapy is also very high when you're sliding scale insulin compared to basal basal insulin therapy. So always stick to basal bolus insulin in the hospitalized patient, not to use the sliding scale. The sliding scale gives you an erroneous way of treating patient diabetes. Patient can never get controlled and the strength of the stay of the patient get delayed. A lot of patients now use this continuous glucose monitoring when they go for surgery it's always better to take them off because we have a lot of problems with this because it's subcutaneous insulin injection and this is the sensor which is subcutaneous which tells you the blood sugar value of subcutaneous tissue, not the blood tissue. There's a lag between, between the subcutaneous glucose versus the blood glucose and it's prudent to not to use these things when the patient is using them. You discard these for the time being, give them intravenous insulin and control their blood sugar and with, get them through the surgery. But if the patient is undergoing a small procedure, like cataract surgery and all that, you can use these, small, these kinds of devices, which are now available. So they're expensive. A lot of patients, especially type 1, are using them. So just uh, to complete the new discovery in insulin called Afriza, which is the inhaled insulin, like how asthmatics takes the medication they can take like this. This is approved by USFDA. It starts very quickly. Within 12 minutes, it works. And veins so within three hours, it's a short-acting insulin. So many patients of type 1 diabetes who are short-acting insulin, of course, you can use this for a short-acting preparation. But remember, this only controls the prandial sugar. For the basal control, you require a basal insulin. And for prevention of ketosis, you require a basal insulin. The most important function of basal insulin is to prevent ketosis. So no patient of type 1 diabetes can be managed without basal insulin. That should be kept in mind. The hypoglycemia can be decreased because it's very short acting and lasts for a short period of time. But patients who have asthma, who have chronic active lung disease or a cancer or COPD, it cannot be used. And before the day of surgery, of course, you need to stop this as well. With that, I think I conclude my talk in saying that consensus regarding pertinent perioperative peri glucose target has achieved but a strong evidence regarding providing a pro improved perioperative peri peri outcome related to it is still lacking. Optimal anti-diabetic drug regimen should avoid severe hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia because that can increase the stay of the hospital and also mortality and morbidity. And recent advances in the drugs for the management of diabetes 
have provided opportunities for improved glycemic control, but the healthcare workers should be familiar with newer technology to overcome the associated therapeutic complexity, patient, staff confusion, and medication errors. With that, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much for the patient listening, and I'll stop sharing with any, any queries, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful lecture. There are a few questions on the chat box. Uh, for high-risk diabetic patients with high creatinine, should we check for the GFR for all patients who is undergoing a GA or a spinal anesthesia? Yes, yes. It's important to check that because the renal status is very essential in the effective outcome of these patients because renal complications can be not only of GFR but also electrolyte imbalance and also sugar values. The sugar starts going down. And these patients experience hypoglycemia. So therefore, a renal function assessment of that and knowing that what is the status of kidney function is the most important. And now we assess these patients by two mechanisms. One is by GFR. And second, what we check also is the proteinuria. Both proteinuria and GFR are important during the surgery, before the surgery, even after the surgery. Because sometimes a kind of a bleeding or a hypotension or there is a volume loss, these patients can get acute kidney injury and they can worsen the existing kidney function. So it's very important to see the renal health throughout the procedure of surgery. Uh, in an emergency surgery, what do we do if the patient is on a GLP-1 agonist? I think you have uh, explained yeah, that. I mean, yeah, this should be stopped early, but if the patient still wants to go for an emergency surgery, I think endotric, I mean, you have to cut endogastric tube and try and aspirate everything else. Or and, to, uh, uh, ultrasonography on tables. Yeah, sonography on table. You can see and ensure the stomach is empty. That is for the legal purpose. Yeah. If the patient aspirates after that, then it becomes a problem. And this aspiration can produce complications subsequently. So, yeah, I think, uh, yes, please elaborate on GLP-1 agonist. I think you've covered the entire thing very well, sir, in the perioperative period. Yeah, remember GLP analogs are very interesting drugs and they have really changed the management of diabetes. They bring down the sugar without hypoglycemia. If you think of insulin, they'll bring down the sugar well, but the hypoglycemia is a price that you pay for it. And here is the molecule which does not do that. And what is more interesting is that one injection of GLP receptor agonist or one tablet of GLP receptor agonist can improve the beta cell function in 24 hours, which no molecule can do. And we are now getting many more molecules in this, in this particular area, which have really changed the outcome. As I mentioned to you earlier, that we have now GLP, GIP analog, which is the name of trisepatide, which has brought the weight loss to a tune of 12 kilograms to 15 kilograms, something similar to bariatric surgery. And without any problems of hypoglycemia, good control. And the benefit in terms of cardiovascular, especially stroke, Reduction of stroke is 20%, which no molecule has done. And that is how it improves the plasticity. It improves the patient's synaptic function so well that patient gets a rewarding you know, benefit. These are the molecules which have become like nectar or amrut for patients of diabetes, which have changed the outcome. All those cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, whether it's diabetic or non-diabetic patients. And this is across the spectrum. And that benefit has come to non-diabetic as well. And therefore, these drugs have been stolen by other specialists from diabetes. The SGLT is stolen by yeah, cardiologists and nephrologists. Yes. Yeah, so, so we are very, very generous in giving these molecules to everybody. So like uh, nowadays, we have seen this in all our cardiac patients before the bypass surgery, whenever they come for an emergency. So I guess they, they start with this drug two or three days prior to the surgery. Yes, now that has been shown again because the size of infarct is also reduced, even in a given an acute setting. So now, you know, the, the SGLT2, for example, they were always have been treated when the patient is stabilized. And then you get this molecule to treat heart failure. Now we are giving within 24 hours, when the patient has six liters of oxygen is going on, at that point of time, this impulse study, for example, using empagliflozin, has shown the outcome tremendously better. So therefore, I think the, the life of patients and of course the doctors is also improved very much with these molecules. 
and these molecules have been stopped early in all the studies. In the past, we had to stop these studies because of the harm produced by drug. And now we are stopping the molecules before, I mean, the study stopped before the completion is because the, the, the other group, the placebo group, is not getting the benefit of the active comparator. So therefore, the entire paradigm has changed. Multiple of statins, which is better, heterostatin. This is little, uh, uh, which is different, little off the subject, but I can answer that. All the statins are good, whether Atova Rosua statin, but there's some important aspect. Rosua statin is much more potent, has a better effect on reducing the cholesterol compared to Atova statin. So potency by Rosua statin is better. But remember, Rosua statin is unsafe in patients of renal failure, where Atova statin is a drug of choice. Because Rosua statin is the water soluble, and therefore, in the patient of impaired kidney function, the levels of creatinine start rising. So, when you have a patient of impaired uh, renal function, use Atova statin and not Rosua statin. Otherwise, Rosua statin, by large, is a very important molecule to control the statin, they control the cholesterol. The Rosua statin at higher mol highest concentration can produce new onset diabetes. So you can create onset of diabetes by using this molecule. So drug-induced diabetes, and their higher dose was used. And the reason why you got this is because these patients had some impairment of the muscle function. And if you know the physiology, 75% of muscle uptake is of that of glucose. So the moment you eat food something, 75% of glucose goes to the muscle. So muscle forms important storage for the glucose. And these statins are known to cause impairment of the muscle function. That's why most of these patients complain of muscle pain, aches, and all that. And that could be the reason why the statin-induced diabetes can occur. And now the, the HGLT2 and GLP are called 21st century statins. They are, of course, better than statins because they do much better work than what the statin does. The number needed to treat with with the SGLT2 is just 10, and that is statin is 40. So that is the difference in statin is. GLP needs to be careful in the HD, and how prone are the CA? Is this true? Yes, there are some reports of the GLP1 causing the parafolic, paracellular tumor in the thyroid, which is called medullary carcinoma of thyroid. In human beings, there are no receptors located in the parafollicular cells, or what's called the C cells. So there is a rodent data that it can produce the middle carcinoma thyroid. But as far as humans are concerned, there is no obvious data to say that these drugs can produce that. But if there's a family history of middle carcinoma of thyroid, or if you've done the calcitonin levels, they're pretty high, then I think you should be careful in looking at the calcitonin level before you start therapy, but uh, I think it's very, very less. It's described in rodents, but not in the routine population. If the question is, is it in setup? GFR frequently is not possible. Any sort of, We have got a lot of apps now. You can just download the app of GFR, just key in the age of the patient, the sex of the patient, and the creatinine level. You get the readymade answer in GFR. But remember, once you get GFR, the two GFR readings should be the identical. Remember, when patient has acute perturbation, like for example, patient starts vomiting in loose motion, and the creatinine goes up slightly because of the hemoconcentration and the acute drop in the GFR is possible natural. Okay, but the two readings or three readings for that matter at weekly intervals should be the same before you say that the GFR is abnormal, just not just by one reading. Remember, that's very important. We covered subjects beyond the diabetes, also like statins. Anything else? About the pancreatic and pancreatic cancer was also thought of when you use the GLP receptor agonist, but it is still not proven. But anybody who has pancreatitis or a pancreatic carcinoma also should not use GLP besides middle carcinoma. Yeah, somebody is asking a question. Amrapali. <clears throat> So it was a wonderful time to talk to you all.
is the first time that I had interaction with an aesthetist because always they are behind the mask. You know, we sometimes you know, we don't identify them also who's who. Sometimes by just eye expression, we can recognize and identify them. The first time I'm seeing them without mask and in the <laughs> open air. So it's a wonderful experience. And I thank all of you, especially Manisha, who's all the time calling me, telling me about updates. And uh, I hope this was uh, some useful talk for you. And if there any more uh, thing that you want me to do for this group, I can, I'm very well, I can do that. Thank you, sir. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you very much. Thank and you. I, I also want to thank uh, Aruna, madam, for getting you on our forum. And oh. I hope someday we'll have a live session as well. That will be very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I leave the meeting, please? If it's okay. Can I have a, one more lecture at 7 o'clock? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So uh, uh, let us start with our second lecture. Um, this is by uh, Ashwini Kanade. She's the research lead at Healing Fields Foundation. She's a PhD scholar, public health nutrition expert, registered dietitian, and a certified diabetic educator with more than 20 years of work experience. Her expertise is behavioral change, that is lifestyle management and in non-communicable disease. Over to you, Ashwini. Uh Thank you, doctor. Uh, thank you, everybody, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. I am audible and my screen is visible to everyone. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I'm overwhelmed to be uh, a part of this esteemed uh, discussion group. And uh, I always say that um, whenever there is a speaker like Dr. Neglur who is talking before you. Your work is half done because he sets the stage so well and he uh, all the participants are so active and listening to the speaker. So I think my job is half done. And I, I just have to ensure that uh, I can just keep up to his uh, one minute. I'm just trying to switch on my camera so that it better connects to everyone. Yeah. Uh, so um, there were a few things I have just taken up from Sir's discussion. Uh, one is that at the initial stages, he just said that uh, the entire focus of the MNTs uh, of the medical treatments have shifted from a, a generic treatment flow uh, for the patients to a more personalized flow. Uh, which fortunately, when I talk about diet, it has been always the same from the day one. We always talk about a personalized treatment for a person with a medical condition or without a medical condition. Uh, the diets never go, uh, they are never a printed patterns to give in to the patients or uh, the clients. What uh, the, the latest market word is a client, not a patient. When a person comes to a dietitian to meet, he becomes a client and not a patient. Unfortunately, uh, that is the fact. Uh, so uh, just going back to Sir's uh, discussion that the diet has to be or the diet therapy has to be personalized. Personalized to the concept that the, the benefits are uh, uh, seeked by the entire family because unlike medicine, the medicine, the person just pops in individually. Whereas the difference is that the diet is usually is taken by the family. Very rarely, very rarely, if it is not a kidney patient, very rarely the diet is for the entire family which is cooked and it is a component of a child who is five years old and a component of uh, who is a grandfather who is almost 85 plus and all the members together eat the same food which is cooked at the family. But at the same time, how it can be individualized or how it can be... Uh, get the best benefit of cooking a family in eating a family meal to an individual is the key today uh, what we have to address um i would like to discuss certain i would not uh, i am calling this entire session as a discussion session and there are certain points i have uh, put in place for my direction uh, and all the questions all the suggestions are welcome here uh, unlike medicine, diet is uh, has uh, multiple aspects to it, and it is always it is never right and wrong. Uh, the the concept which you might have uh, may fit into a different scenario, and the concept which I am going to talk today may, might fit into a different scenario. So I am currently not sitting here and not going to tell you that what you are thinking about diet is wrong and what I'm going to tell you about diet is right. And from tomorrow is this is the way you have to think about diet. Though so this is not the entire discussion. Um, my slides. Are not... 
Oh, yes. Um, so uh, as rightly introduced by Dr. Parna, uh, that November was a month of uh, Diabetes Awareness Month. 14 November is celebrated as a Diabetes Day. Uh, I remember in my initial ages of uh, starting of career, someone had told me that there is no concept of writing a di diabetic diet. Please start rethinking about this concept. Please write, start rewriting about it and now talk about healthy lifestyle. So in any of my conversations, uh, wherever it is in healthy lifestyle, it's, I am uh, talking exclusively, holistically about all the patterns, um, very sp specific medical nutrition therapies such as kidney disease, liver disorders, uh, cancers, they would need a very different therapy. But diet comes into a picture of preventive medicine. And here I'm talking about healthy lifestyle. So please don't think about a diabetic diet henceforth. Uh, the WHO definition is not new to anyone. WHO talks about a healthy lifestyle is the focus uh, on incorporating the eight concepts of well-being. In these eight concepts, I am going to talk about physical activity, diet and physical activity, what I am concentrating today. We all, as Sir had rightly taken you all to the first le uh, lecture of uh, your MBBS degrees, I am just trying to help you understand what you eat in your plate and when you look at your pl diet plate, what it comp consists of. There are different colors in your plate and this different colors talk about carbohydrates, proteins, fats, fiber, vitamins, minerals, calcium and iron. So we all know that carbohydrates are basically the energy giving foods. Proteins are for the repair and uh, growth. Fats are basically for the lubrication and for the uh, cellular functioning. Fiber is for your gut health, for your overall health and disease prevention. Vitamins, minerals, calcium, iron have their own supportive and protective uh, nature in the diet. So um, this is something interesting I would like to discuss with you is how much do Indians currently eat? We all include a typical diet, which is a family diet, a traditional diet. Different cultures have different uh, traditions which are consumed. So this, this was a study conducted in uh, 2020. And uh, this study was done on Indians. And in Indians in every state, this study was done. And different people from different economic strata were included in this study. So the study, the, uh, the researchers concluded that the richest of the richest households consume somewhere around 3000 calories per day per person. I am sure everyone is aware of the calorie concept because that's a very uh, uh, glamorous word which is used everywhere. Calories is something everyone knows. Someone can just say unmute and say calories is something everyone knows, right? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So that study said that across the different states, all the rich people, there were certain parameters with which they had defined which are rich people. They have consumed almost around 3000 calories per day per person. The poorest households consume somewhere around 1645 kilocalories per day. An average Indian total calories counted was 2,200 calories per day. These numbers are really very high numbers. And this another chart is trying to tell us that what, what exactly are the processed components of processed foods, components of uh, whole foods, vegetables, fruits, animal foods in our diet. And when Indian diet was compared with the other countries and with China, what we have seen that 39% of the Indian population is consuming processed foods very commonly. Only 23% of the population in, in India is consuming vegetables and fruits. Uh, almost 27% of Indians are consuming animal foods as a part of their diet. And only 11% are consuming nuts and seeds. Now, we would need to have a different lecture to explain the importance of increasing the vegetable and fruit content. Of course, in one of us, the surveys, one of our question was vegetables and fruits, and I'll come to those numbers here. Uh, why processed foods? Why it is good? Why it is bad? Why the consumption is increasing? What is the role of our dietary behaviors in that? What is the role of the FMCG companies? What is the role of the media? It itself is a big topic to be discussed. And the role of nuts and seeds is very, uh, very well understood, but very well, uh, very poorly accepted by Indians. 
Now, when we saw about how much Indians are eating, let's understand what is that component of 3,000 which is going into the richest diet, whereas in 2,200 average diet going into an average Indian diet. So our diets across the states, the cereal content is 70%. Cereals uh, are basically a basic source of carbohydrates. Uh, the cereals are everything such as rice, rotis, breads, jowar, bajra, oats, everything comes under cereals. Fruits and vegetables consumption is almost less than 40% of recommendations. And the protein is the lowest. This has been a study multiple years, multiple times. Uh, different researchers have come up with the uh, problem statement that protein intake in the Indian diet is very low. In, sp in spite of multiple problems uh, arising due to protein intake is high. The protein intake is 6 to 8% only. We will, I will also talk about what are the recommendations for proteins here. The same study also looked at the physical activity because okay, in spite of the 3000 calorie intake, there was it was not uh, proportionate to the body weight percentage and also the physical activity. The sedentary behavior is very high in Indians. So only 34% of 34% uh, of Indians are not doing any physical activity. We have this one question in our survey as well. So if this is the case in what India is currently consuming, what is the ICMR, that is the Indian Council of Medical Research, N9, that is National Institute of Nutrition, talking about? They have given us from almost, Sir Gopalan has been working on the nutrient content for uh, Indian consumptions from ages. And these guidelines have been, uh, every 10 years, these guidelines keep revising. The latest which has come up is the 2020 guidelines. I'll, this is a little complex and these are little numbers. I'll just take a little extra time discussing this uh, slide. So calories when talking about, so NIN says that an adult man should weigh 65 kgs. That is an ideal body weight for a sick man. And adult woman should weigh 55 kgs. What is the current weight? Another topic of discussion. So calories in our uh, uh, differentiation of uh, calories or talking about calories, we always define a person's activity as sedentary activity, moderate activity and heavy activity. Now it is a controversial topic whether all the anesthetists come into a moderate activity or a heavy activity or a sedentary activity because the definitions according to WHO is very different. Having said that, the calorie requirement per sedentary activity for an adult man is 2110 kilo kilocalories per day. And for a female, it is almost 1660 kilocalories per day. And that is increasing as the amount of physical activity increases. Say, saying said that, having said that about calories, now come, let's come to the protein content. So protein currently actually has now become a more of a topic to be discussed on medium. What is the protein content? There are a lot of uh, superstars or uh, Bollywood stars who are talking about the protein requirement and the uh, intake by the uh, Indian uh, people. So as per the uh, NIN ICMR guidelines, one gram per kg body weight per day is the protein requirement. So if an adult has to be 65 kgs, the person intake has to be uh, one, 65 grams. Not that if the person is weighing 100 kgs, the person should start having 100 kgs. That, that should not be the calculation because it is going to have an adverse effect on the body. Similarly, there, ha there is a concept which is talked about cereal, legume and milk composition compare, uh, ratio. There is a ratio when we talk about this. So the uh, NIN says that in a diet, in a day's diet, the cereal should have three components. Legume should have uh, one component and the milk should have almost 2.5 uh, parts of it. This is how it becomes a complete ideal diet. Uh, when we talk about diet, there is one component which we cannot overlook and that is oil. Unfortunately, whenever we give a lecture to a common man and uh, medically illiterate person, the first person they say is, which konsa oil buy karna chahiye? And I feel very sorry for this because this question never comes as, as how much oil should I buy for the good health of my family? And the answer is it's half a kg per person per month. And there is no single oil which is good enough 
for the betterment of entire family's health. The requirements differ as per the age group. The requirement differs as per the uh, uh, physical activity. But a combination of MUFA, PUFA and saturated acid, fatty acids is always an ideal. So you, we traditionally, most of the Indian families have uh, certain types of oil used for cooking, certain types of oil used only for the uh, vaghar uh, short things used uh, there's always a ghee uh, component added to your rice or rotis so this is a combination of your mufa pufa and saturated fats which has to be included regularly in your diet uh, so this is uh, a little interesting now uh, so you have to answer these questions to yourself. I see that there were somewhere around 56 participants when we started and uh, we had run a survey yesterday and uh, the, we have received somewhere around 33 responses till evening 5.30. Uh, people who could not uh, answer this survey, you can just answer it for yourself now. So the question was, uh, do you experience food cravings? Do you consider food as a reward for a hard day? Do you reward yourself with a food during an achievement? And do you get upset with yourself for eating any unhealthy snack or meal? If the answer to any of the four questions or at least all the four questions or any one question is yes, then the above questions may conclude that one person is under a is called a, could be a stress eater. And most of the time, stress eating is not synonymous to healthy eating. So what happens where, and I'm going to give you some uh, takeaway messages also, what we can have. So now, um, what are stress eating, what are comfort? If you might be aware of the word terminal. comfort food also so uh, many comfort foods uh, in my career of 20 25 years i haven't heard any time anyone saying that karela is my comfort food whenever i get a little uh, hard day i go and eat a karela so most of the time the comfort food is uh, either a fried snack most of the time a packet food and ice cream and chocolate sometimes maybe because of the age we might not eat but given a choice we would always prefer it because ice creams and chocolates always media is relating it to the younger age group than the uh, senior age group hot beverages specifically tea and coffee are the very big comfort food comfort um, providers and hard drinks at times so do we have a solution Yes, we do have a solution. What do we do about it? We can plan ahead, know your options, be assertive when in group. Usually when we go with friends or family for the common meals, we usually say, what do you want to order? Anything. Anything works for me. So most of the times your choice is not being discussed. Your choice, you are not able to express what you want to say, uh, want to eat or what you want to demand. And the food which is serving is being served to you is basically a common food or someone else's choice is being served to you. So we always say that be assertive. Know what you want to eat. Today I want to eat pav bhaji. So it is, I know I, I need to have pav bhaji. Then I have to decide whether I'm going to have a butter pav bhaji, cheese pav bhaji or some other pav bhaji. Then it differs there. Take charge of your thoughts. Exactly what are you craving for? Are you really craving for food? Then just think over it and then give an approach towards it. And eat well when away from home. So again, as I said, uh, what Indians are eating is a big topic for discussion. Nutrients is a big topic for discussion. Similarly, plan ahead, know your options, be assertive and take charge of your thoughts is a well-studied concept given by AD, American Diabetic Association. And this is basically in the diabetes prevention program, which is running for almost now more than 23 years across the globe. So they have given these terminologies, they have given these thoughts, they have given this framework to make yourself aware about your eating habits and how to be strong. So I will not discuss everything in detail. I will directly go to eat well when away from home. And most of the times when I was interacting with one of your uh, colleagues, I realized that uh, you might be experiencing regularly or sometimes a week a very stressful day. A stressful day, I mean, uh, I would like to, uh, the operational definition of stressful day here is basically a long case wherein you have been standing for hours together 
maybe because of complications, maybe because of the nature of the surgery, or it could be that you were unwell and you still had committed for that work and you have reached that place. And secondly, uh, that could be a physical stress as well as a mental stress. So what you do when you are away from home? So first thing is the survey, I'll tell you what our survey data says first and then give you the solutions. Um, the survey data says that whichever is good, I am not highlighting that. Whichever is something which ne we need to, as an individual, look for. Uh, let's look at those numbers. So 88% of the respondents said that food craving is very high. They have food craving. 73% said that this uh, they uh, reward themselves uh, uh, with food when they have a hard day. Uh, are everyone able to relate to this? This was a survey uh, which we have just circulated a day before because there were some participants who had not a part of the survey. So these yeah. were the questions which we had asked them. And uh, so 73% uh, again said that I reward with food. Uh, wherever there is an achievement. Achievement could be simple. It could be your achievement, your family member's achievement, any. But when you feel good, uh, ups, uh, awareness, as we all know, as you all are from the medical fraternity, the awareness levels are very high. There is a knowledge, there is awareness. Sometimes they're missing, which is a practice. So you get upset when you're not eating an uh, Unhealthy, you get you get upset when you're you know, eating an unhealthy meal. So there is an awareness about it, a guilt feeling. Aata hai. We also asked about because I'm going to talk about the food label reading. We also asked the participants whether they read the label. So I'll when we come to that slide, I'll explain what I'm meaning about food label. So this there are 25 percent who in our responses who say that they do not read the food label. Good, bad, better, we can talk about it. And there are still in our group, we have 12% such people that who do not do any form of physical activity. People who are doing great. But this is something for them who have not who have said that they do any they do not do any physical activity. It is the starting time now. Okay, coming back to a hard day and uh, a food as a reward. These two behaviors are basically directly related to your psychology. Hard day is basically a stressful day, maybe a physical stress, a mental stress, wherein you feel low, prakam lagta hai, achha nahi lagta, upset the highest, and you are happy. Both the times, am I audible? Because my internet seems to be unstable. Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Yeah. <clears throat> so both the times, either it is it is related to psychology. So we have to ensure that my body is not controlled by my mind. I am controlling my mind. This, this is something my eating habits are a, a reason there we can relook at ourselves. So uh, when I was talking to one of your colleagues, I just realized that you need to have some options ready, handy to eat, wherein you can avoid unhealthy eating outside or street food outside, which we can say unhealthy. And what are those, those options? So I'm just giving that uh, four options. These four options are in the category of one is the uh, most preferred, four is the Four can be, uh, it's okay. I mean, there are people who are vegetarian. I think a majority of our participants have said that they are vegetarian. So, boiled egg for them could be the least of uh, the category. And the last uh, row uh, column is talking about, no, this is not to be consumed. Okay, so early morning, what can you have is fruits, dry fruits, protein bars or boiled eggs or a protein bars can be. Now, this, when I say protein bars, they need not be the processed uh, outside ones. You have the various simple recipes which you can be made at home and you can have that. There are a lot of simple protein bars. Simple could be your chikki also. So you can have that as one of the options where you're leaving very early because if your case starts somewhere around 6, 6.30, then you've not even managed your breakfast that day. So then what? Please do not go for the work with, with only tea and biscuits. Uh, the, the worst thing you can do to your body and your mind is having tea and breakfast and starting a case. 
for breakfast you can have any south indian freshly cooked south indians i do not prefer when you eating outside south indians i do not cook have uh, in the second part of the day because the uh, the food gets a little more ferment the batter gets a little more fermented outside because it is not stored at the proper temperatures and so south indian eating in the second half of the day usually the person feels bloating uh, burping zyada hota hai so i usually recommend south indian only in the first half of the day dahi and paratha is one of the best and available across everywhere boiled eggs you can carry with yourself protein bars you can carry please do not have just a fruit juice or a canned juice or a sugar free juice we'll come to it why not juice juices lunch you can have stuffed parathas how many of you carry tiffin boxes i didn't ask this question it was a nice question to ask actually i carry they can reply in the chat they can be a wholesome they can uh, you can mix two or two different three flours together wheat flour chana flour uh, soya bean flour roasted soya bean flour or different flours and make it at home you can make it a multi grain flour and add vegetables to it add dals to it add paneer to it and you can just make a stuffed paratha for yourself the name sounds a little more elaborative or exclusive but it is a simple recipe sprouts can be consumed sprouts needs a little plan ahead because sprouts you need to have soaked before and then carry you this is something very interesting and i'm sure none of you must have thought about it sticks of cucumber and carrot with peanut butter or sticks of apples with peanut butter this is a very wholesome breakfast you can have uh, or you can have it for your lunch as well multi grain now again when i'm talking that less processed foods i still have to give you an option of bread because that is the convenient food today so we have a little better choice by having it little multi grain breads there please do not have fried rice or chinese items for your lunch you are going to spoil your entire evening after eating that uh, similarly for dinners wherever possible if it is uh, possible for you to close your activities and come home somewhere around 7:38 i know you are you are going to raise your eyebrows after this numbers but how much as possible if you can manage khichdi at evening early evenings or you can have a proper full meal at 7:30 the later part of the day try and have least minimum food intake please do not say that i had a very bad day i have skipped all my meals in the day i have not had anything healthy unhealthy kuch bhi nahi khaya hai so i deserve a complete meal today i am now going to have a nice meal so i'm going to have my number of x number of chapatis i'm going to have rice i'm going to have dal i'm going to have vegetables i need a, my curd or my buttermilk everything i'm going to have a dessert as well that would be a really big mess up we are going to do with our body Our sleep are going to uh, hampered. Our next day activities are going to hampered. Our ball bowel system is going to be hampered. So don't please whenever there is an early meal, a uh, late meal, have a light meal. Dalia khichdi is a very good option. You can have masala rotis. You can have soup and fresh salads. You can have. This is something now I am a little more uh, appreciative about the fast food centers because they have a variety of salads available. indian culture we still do not have so much of salad making at home only because when you buy a salad there is a major portion of which uh, in terms of time convenience it's it's not time convenient it is not portion convenient it is not liked by everyone so salad is some, i'm not talking about raita i'm talking about salad so salad is not very often uh, cooked by the family members at home uh whenever in dinners please don't have maida rich butter rich rotis or tadkas and dals and very heavy wherein that color is as red as your blood please don't have those curries with the uh, oil flowing everywhere and then mid meals what you can have is you can have roasted chana you can have popcorns you can have fresh corns you can have roasted makhana you can have dry bhels don't have diet bhel you don't need to have that because when you eat a diet bhel and the end of that uh, packet you can see that everything is salt inside so don't and none of these other than the bread none of these are your packet foods all you can actually make at home and eat from home and a complete no no please from your tomorrow is 1st of december in your grocery list please do not get any maggi please do not get any biscuits please do not get any chocolates uh when you have to buy those cereal breakfast cereals you have to be very cautious about breakfast cereals you want to consume because lately what i have seen is uh most of the families i'm not saying you you are doing it most of the families maggi comes into your uh, ration 
which is very wrong. I'm sorry, I'm taking a name of a brand, but it is noodles which are coming into your brand uh, house as a uh, ration. You, you should not do that. So uh, purchasing, making a grocery list itself is very important. And I'm glad we are having this discussion today on the last day of the month, wherein most of the families are going to make a grocery list tomorrow. Uh, so after briefly discussing, because this can also take another one full lecture, ki what, when, how, where, but just as an take home message, this is what you can eat and this is what you cannot eat. Uh, no is, I'm very firm that you should not eat this. This option one, two, three, four can be better. Uh, if someone is a better cook than me, I'm sure uh, you don't need to be a dietitian for that options. You need to be a little smart in terms of your choices and your observations, what you can actually make at home and carry with yourself. Uh, now let's in next, uh, also please tell me I missed uh, noting the time when I started, how much time I have. I can just rush forward uh, with uh, covering the important points. Uh, Amra Paniji, I know, I 10 know. minutes more? Yeah, 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, so physical activity and diet concepts, um, we all know that uh, exercise is very important, but there is a difference between a physical activity and an exercise. Uh, you might have experienced someone saying that I stand for a surgery and open heart surgery for eight hours together. And then what do you expect me to do an exercise after this? I am already exerting. So there is a difference between exercise and physical activity. We need to understand that. As I rightly said, there is no food which is, I let's not call the food and blame it with a junk food or a food because a vada pav which is made outside, eaten outside is always called as a junk food. But don't we as Indians cook vada pav at home at least five times a year? So uh, do you say that junk food which is cooked at home, the food which is cooked at home also is a junk food? So it doesn't go by the definition. So we are going to talk about uh, right time and wrong time and we are going to, uh, most probably this is something um, related to what Sir was talking sometime back was a diabetic friendly, a heart friendly, a zero fat diet and what about it. So physical activity, exercise are two different concepts. However, physically active you. So one my one of my very senior doctor whom I was practicing with, Dr. Vinod Durandar, he had just once told uh, a patient very, very strongly, very assertively, ki, uh, and the person was trying to tell uh, doctor, ki, uh, doctor, mein bahut kaam karti I'm really very active entire day. And uh, I don't think so, ki whatever exercise you're telling me, I don't need that anymore. He said, I agree, madam. I completely agree. I know that none of us are ever sitting on the wheelchairs. Only a person who is sitting on a wheelchair or lying on the bed is not doing a physical activity. If you open the door 10 times to see who has come or answer a call, get up from a place and answer a landline call, you are moving and you are doing a physical activity and I respect that. But that is not going to actually uh, leave your reasons for not doing an exercise. Exercise is a very structured format, a very specific to different muscles. And now we, uh, uh, Dr. Neglur had been talking about the role of muscles on glucose uptake and everything. Knowing the fact that we have to have that in weight reduction, we have to have an exercise which is muscle oriented which is not machine oriented. I'm trying to say this here because we, we have certain um, participants who are using gym. You, I think uh, 66 were walking, some 37 were doing yoga and there was uh, 12 or 15 percent who were doing gym also. So most of the time in the mass, uh, gym, not always, I'm again saying that not always, all the muscles are utilized properly. But walking, yes, they are utilized to a certain extent. Yoga, too, yes, they are utilized to a certain extent. But in physical activity and exercise, this is the major difference that the proper structured, uh, observed under the proper training, a uh, proper trainer is looking at you and then you're performing an uh, exercise. That is important and that cannot have any pill. I'm sorry, exercise. We can have uh, insulin inhalers. We can have everything. We can have diet pills. We can have pills to reduce our weight. But there is no uh, pill which is going to help us burn our calories and replace it for the exercise. So it is very important and we need, all need to be physically active. 
so let's not talk about uh, when talking about healthy food and uh, unhealthy food let's now move our concept from healthy and unhealthy to something which is right time and a wrong time so most of the times it does happen that a meal which is consumed in a specific period of time was a requirement and that's the reason it becomes a right time rather than becoming an junk junk food or an unhealthy food for example um, sometimes it could happen i am sure it doesn't happen in india but sausages are very commonly consumed in the uh, even in the breakfast in the western countries so sausages per se we do say that they are unhealthy but if they are consumed in the right quantity at the right uh, time then it it can be considered as an healthy food so right uh, so rather than uh, thinking about an healthy and an unhealthy food start thinking about the right time and a wrong time that will help us to make major changes in our diet habits uh, most of the times whenever we are uh, we are looking watching a uh, tv and uh, watching in serial commercial ad sorry uh, we get a little carried away with the most uh, attractive uh, commercials wherein they say that this product is now labeled as an diabetic friendly so a diabetes a person can start having this food and it is not going to hamper the sugar levels this is very heart friendly this has uh, this component and it is uh, cholesterol free and everything and everything and everything it's a very complex activity none of the foods can ever be only diabetic friendly if one food is a sugar free it need not be a fat free food so if a diabetic has to think about it the diabetic can think of one activity of it which is a sugar component however uh, talking about uh, the fat component which is also very important for a diabetic person in his diet is not managed with these products so very importantly please don't get carried away with its concepts of diabetic friendly heart friendly zero uh, fat diets these are not the true actually to the terminologies and to be aware of all these things what do we need to have is uh, we need to have a food label literacy and what is food label literacy is most of the times whenever i randomly interact with people and i ask them ki do you read a food label so i was always surprised to have a answer yes and when i ask okay theek hai what do you read in that food label the first thing comes to me is i i look for the cost i look for the expiry date and unfortunately that is one of the uh, the the smallest thing which can be a contributor to a food label a food label itself is a big 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 information uh, in a chart which is to be provided uh, by all the uh, fssai approved uh, food products in the market what does a food label basically talk about it is talking about serving information that one packet can be consumed by how many people every person uh, how many calories that one person is going to give for example you can just go back uh, today to the market and whenever you go to the market and check that one wafer packet any company you just check a wafer packet on the back side of the uh, packet it is always written the number of servings most of the times the bigger packet which are the money savers which we buy which was buy, uh, what or advertised during even during the covid uh, the, the world cup time were the bigger packets and they are not the one serving packets i'm sure the serving size for that such packets are more than 4 to 5 people but what happens as in human behavior once a packet is opened very rarely it is shared in indian families just close your eyes and see for yourself and judge if this is happening at your family an apple is cut and it is divided by four members of the family the samosa is bought and it is consumed by single we are not sharing that samosa so this is how actually our health is getting impacted similarly one packet of wafers which was informed to me as a consumer that this is a packet of four people to be consumed i have never read the food label i have consumed it single handedly on my own so that 280 calories which i see acha 280 hi mila hai but that 280 was something which only if i ate my share of that packet but i have ate the pack share of every four uh, all the four members in the family and i have consumed everything so this was an interesting study which was done in india again wherein they had compared 
different uh, categories in males and females of course females look at the uh, food labels more than co when compared to females uh, in upper middle income and uh, high income families the upper middle income look more on the uh, packets than the middle high income ca categories and people in the age group of 20 to 30 are the maximum who look for the food labels because i'm sure this is the age group which the person starts thinking about our self image how I look, how uh, am I fat, am I, am I thin, I am muscular and that's the reason there is a lot of awareness in this age group because 20 to 30 they read a food label. Again, this is only one aspect of the behavior that is reading. It is awareness, it is knowledge, but is it converting to practices? Again, it will need a different uh, uh, this thing. And fortunately, married and unmarried, the unmarried ones actually look at the food labels more uh, than the married ones. So last, I think, two to three slides, I'll just run randomly to these questions. So whenever there is a dietitian uh, talking or a person visiting a dietitian, it is always about a diet chart. And what is a diet chart? So there are researchers across the globe and there are multiple uh, patterns or types of diet which have come to uh, surface and followed randomly, unadvised, short-lived, with inviting multiple health problems uh, at an individual level then going to a uh, specialist. I would not say only a dietitian, even to a, a, a physician, uh, uh, your family doctor. There's no con a conversation happening with the family doctors as well about this. So these, these are the diet patterns. These diet, again, I would not say that they are bad. You should not never follow them. There are cases when you need to follow a particular dietary regime. In sense, what happens is basically you have to remove, eliminate certain types of food groups from your diet to get certain benefits. And that's how the diet becomes, for example, a, a, what do you say, let's talk about gluten-free diet. So there are certain medical conditions with it uh, related to your gut wherein you cannot have any gluten, the protein content in the cereals. So you need to remove them from your diet. So that is a medically uh, driven decisions and that's the reason you do it. But what has happened lately? People have started following it very blindly saying that if you want to lose weight, start, have a, start having a gluten-free diet. Indians have been known to have chapatis as their staple food. Even the South Indians in India have the staple food. At least in one meal, they do have chapatis. Maybe one is completely rice-oriented, but one has chapatis. So if tomorrow you start telling a person who is an Indian whose staple food is wheat, remove wheat only for the benefit of weight loss, then it is an unfair decision given to them. Uh, vegan diet. Vegan diet is basically talking about different ways, uh, uh, eliminating the poultry and the milk, animal origin products completely from your diet. This was started with certain group of people and they had basically certain mindset of uh, animal activists, uh, you can say some, some different form and then that came up into the picture that the minute you start vegan diet, you start losing weight. So I think that again is not the right way of approaching it. There are different ways of having time restricted diets. There are intermittent fasting diets. I'm not taking the name of the doctors associated with these uh, therapies. They are good. Uh, they are beneficial. They have shown impacts. But is it individualized? Is it long lasting? Can I follow that change? Because humans are social animals. So if I tell you that you should not eat anything uh, when you're going out and meeting people, I'm sure you'll stop eating. I mean, you'll stop you know, being social again. Then that's going to hamper your mental health as well. So if there are multiple forms of diets available, please consult your medical professionals and then go ahead about it. Again, no diet is good or bad, but anything done in extremes without medical supervision is always bad. These are small, last two slides. These are just two small tips. I'm sure everyone knows about it. Always consult your doctor, please. Uh, do a checkup. Plan your food. Keep it simple. Do not have an elaborate recipe. Vary your food. Humans are associating with colors. Humans are associating. Uh, food is very deeply associated with the satiety value. Satiety value is deeply associated with my emotions. So the more I have variety in my diet, I feel emotionally and mentally satisfied. And that is very important as in social uh, 
human being here to survive. Start your day with a healthy breakfast. Never skip your breakfast. I think this is something we all have been uh, hearing, learning from our childhood. Eat small and frequent meals if you are busy. If you feel that you are com coming with some specific health components, then please consult your doctor and then have small and regular meals. Drink plenty of water. When you say plenty of water, again, there are multiple calculations and there are apps, as Sir was saying, uh, to simply calculate based on your height, your weight and your activity, what is your water requirement. On an average, 8 to 10 glasses is what you need daily to consume, uh, to be uh, healthy. Eat more uh, healthy carbohydrates. When I say healthy carbohydrates, try and have, which is white in color, that is sugar, salt and maida. These three things have to go out of your kitchen. And health actually comes in, e walking easily. So these are the top 10 mantras. I'm sure every Google will help you understand this. Zero empty calories. What are empty calories? Uh, another big lecture. Uh, one hour of uh, reading always uh, rejuvenates your health. Two liters of water, which converts into eight to 10 glasses. Uh, three cups of green tea or green juice. Uh, green tea, again, another one lecture. But uh, here I would not say... Uh, only restrict to green tea because excessive green tea also leads to dehydration. But at least uh, some amount of um, natural uh, antioxidant dose is very important for your body. Four mental and uh, uh, stretches break is required if you're working for a very long time. I'm sure you will not take them when you're working on an open heart surgery. Uh, uh, five, you have to be grateful for your health. Uh, at least uh, remember those five things. Meditation always helps. Even I think today one of the report which came was the Indian hockey team or the Indian football team have started doing a meditation sessions and they had struggled for six months to get every player do that meditation session together. And because the people were not convinced that it is so important for improving my game. So meditation is very important and there are a lot of research and a lot of activities happening around that. Laughter is the best medicine. Eight hours of sleep is very important. Be away from your uh, digital uh, media as early as possible and be in your bed at the right time every day at the same time. 9 p.m. sleep, I know it is not possible in pe for people in Bombay especially. And 10,000 footsteps is very essential. People, I think 66% of people in our survey have said that uh, they walk. So please count that you're walking for 10,000 steps at least for 30 to 35, uh, it is, uh, WHO says that 150 minutes per week is your walking target. So if you're walking, if you, now the next step is that awareness that what, how much am I walking? Is it giving me the benefit? And then we can uh, talk about brisk walking and normal walking. So these are the steps of how you can gradually improve your workouts. So lastly, I would say that don't start a diet that has an expiry date. Develop a healthy lifestyle. This will last forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwini, for such a wonderful lecture. I think we are running Pleasure. out of time. So, uh, I guess uh, the discussion... Uh, uh, yeah, if you right want now. to uh, share those questions with me separately, uh, and uh, I should be answering them, just to, uh, with respect to time, just let me know. I'm okay with that. Mm. Hi. Just one more um, thank you, Anjali, ma'am. Yeah, Manisha. Thank you. Thank you, Shweta, ma'am. I think one or two questions are there. We can just quickly answer them, Ashwini. Dikshit yes. diet. Yes. They have asked people have asked about Dikshit diet. Is it good? <laughs> uh I would, uh, he is a medical, he is a very senior person from the medical profession. Uh, the problem with Dikshit diet, what has happened is there are certain set of people who have benefited what? from it. There are certain people, set of people who have not benefited from it. And the reason behind that is we have just understood Dikshit diet from a very um, uh, a bird's view concept. When, we, when Dr. Dikshit is talking about the dietary habits, there is a process what we need to have in that 45 minutes when i say process there there is the selection of food there is a quantity of the food which you have to consume and how much and how uh, how uh, 
fast you can consume in that 45 minutes. The only concept which a common man has understood is that I can eat in two intervals and in 45 minutes I can eat anything. So they actually count that 45 minutes on the clock and they start eating right from pizza to a vada pav to your roti, sabzi, everything in that 45 minutes. And I'm very sorry to say that however it is restrict, time restricted, it is also calorie defined. You cannot have... So what is intermittent fasting? What is Dixit diet? Everything is basically you are controlling the amount of calories which you are going to intake. So you give me any name, you can tomorrow call your name and just say any uh, diet form. The concept is calorie restriction and nothing more than that. So a Dixit diet also has not worked with a lot of people because they have not understood the details about it. Okay. Uh, some light on millets versus uh, wheat consumption. Yeah. So, uh, 2023 is a millet year announced by uh, the government. So, millets are good. They are uh, a better nutrient composition when compared to wheat. But end of the day, it also has the same nutritional properties. Components are different, they are a little high. So fiber is high, minerals are a little high in the millet component. So it doesn't mean that I can actually oversee my quantity. Again, the point comes in here is the portion control. I cannot have three uh, bhakris or three rotis of jowar and bajra or ragi because they are millet and they are good uh, versus uh, ideally I was having just two chapatis, the wheat flour made chapatis. Millets are good, but again done in excess is not healthy. I think uh, uh, we can uh, go ahead with the second part of the session. Sure. So, thank you. Pleasure. So, yeah, we'll start with the video recipe. The first uh, will be presented by Dr. Manisha Ghosh. Manisha Ghosh. Uh, I am not hear. able to hear no, the hear. volume for this. Yeah, yeah. They want. What do you want? One bit. Isn't that all? Bundu. Can't hear you. Manisha, uh, it's not audible. It is a recorded video and I am not sharing it. That, um, so Ganesh will have to look into that. Ganesh? I am sharing it. Ganesh, I am not video. Anyway, so this is a chana chaat uh, recipe. We have some black chanas which have been soaked and boiled, um, uh, soaked overnight and then boiled. And then we have our usual uh, boiled uh, peanuts. Um, onions, tomatoes, green chilies, coriander, lemon juice, uh, salt, uh, red chili powder. Okay. It's bolti hai. Let's not waste time. So the boiled chana, the peanuts, finely chopped onions, tomatoes, uh, lemon juice, green coriander has all been added together. There is some rock salt as well for extra taste. And we have mixed up everything and then topped it with some uh, pomegranate seeds. So this is like a, a evening snack which can be tasty, umami, Yummy and also healthy at one and the same time. I, 
I hope you all like it. Ganesh, please look into the video for the next one, huh? video and sound. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Manisha. This is a nice recipe. Short and sweet. I will share it on WhatsApp group. <laughs> so there was no sound here. Ganesh, please make sure the next video has sound. Yes, yes, madam. Yeah. We can include this into the options also. Sprout salad. I hope it was a healthy recipe, Ashwini. Yes, 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 it was. It was indeed a healthy recipe. Yes, you can add it to your table next time. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Next video, please, Ganesh. Yes, madam. So next video is with Dr. Ashwini. It is audible. Hello. Yes, it is audible. You can just increase the volume immediately. Boiling, reduce the flame to medium. 
Cover the vessel with a lid and let it simmer for 15 minutes for the dal to cook to a very soft consistency. Now that the dal has cooked very well, we will put on the flame and allow the da uh, mixture to cool down. Once it has cooled down, we will blend this mixture in a mixer or with a hand blender. Now that we have got a good consistency of the soup after blending, we transfer the soup to the vessel and reheat it before serving. We are almost ready with the soup. We can adjust the consistency of the soup as per our liking. So this soup is almost ready, which is high in proteins, is rich in the dietary fibers, it has got low glycemic index, low fat content, and it has got nutrients like folate, iron, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and phosphorus, and also antioxidants like polyphenols, which are cardioprotective. This soup gives a feeling of fullness and satiety, and it helps in weight management. So now, just before serving this soup, we add in the lemon juice. After adding the lemon juice, we transfer the soup to the soup bowl. The soup is garnished with the chili oil we prepare and with parsley. And now it is ready to serve. So, bon appetite. Yeah, Amrapali. Dr. Ashwini, it was a wonderful recipe. Uh, can we start with the children's video? The first presentation is by Eva Joshi. Eva Joshi. गणेश आवाज क्लियर नहीं है ब्रेक ब्रेक हो तो है आवाज गणेश मैम तो वीडियो से प्रॉब्लम है मैम तो माजा करने में उससे चालू ही करना
on the second video by Ishan Joshi. Now the video will be presented by Ishan Joshi. Rajan Joshi, sir, are you there? Dr. Rajan Joshi? I video I So these two kids are the grandchildren of our dear Dr. Rajan Joshi, sir. And they live in America. They were born there. They don't speak Marathi well, but they are trying to learn. And um, yet they are able to sing in Marathi, which many of our children yeah. living here might not be doing. So it's highly creditable that uh, they are being taught the uh, Marathi songs in America. <laughs> Ganesh, please take care of video audio. Yes, ma'am. The next song, uh, Preksha Patil. My name is Preksha Patil, the daughter of Dr. Shweta Hemant Patil. I am 11 years old and I am studying in 5th standard of Shri Mati Sulochana Devi Singhanya School. I play basketball and I am currently representing for my school in the school competitions. Last year, I got the opportunity 
to write short stories on the three books platform. To name a few of my books, I would say Cute Pets, Trapezonia Nile Castle, The, the Toy World, and Adit and his Adventures. Last year, I also received the Good Samaritan Award. My hobbies include the pepper painting, So Preksha is a very, very versatile child and she's been a great help to us in a lot of our programs where she has taken care of the technical, she's been the technical support of her mother, Shweta, who is another strong pillar of our branch. So Preksha is my favorite child, I must say. Thank you, Manisha. Today also she's gone for her uh, inter-school basketball uh, match. So she's not here. Otherwise, I would have shown her. Thank you, Shweta. Thank you, Shweta. So, next video by uh, Karthik Tarapur. Uh, I'm Dr. Kavita Tarapur. My son Karthik Tarapur will play live, basically. Uh, uh, if we can stop the video, it will be better. He'll play live uh, a song. Ganesh, video match play karo. Yes, madam. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let it tell him to start. Please, you can yes. start. Yeah. Karthik start. He he's singing a song. Tera mujse. <laughs> Kavita, we can't hear. Uh, can't hear. Yeah. You can hear now? I can hear you, but can't hear the song. Okay, I'll... Uh, now it's okay? Karthik, thoda yeah, yeah, you can start, you can start. Karthik, you start. Uh -huh. Ask to Mara. I'm 
राहुल शाह Yes, yes, ma'am. Ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Should I yeah. introduce him? Yes, ma'am. Yes. yes. I am Dr. Ila Shah. My son, Dr. Rahul Manar Shah, is an oral and maxillofacial surgeon since 2014. He has placed maximum number of zygoma implants globally over 250 using Navident technology. He has a copyright for the technique to use Navident for placement of zygomatic implants. to his name he is very passionate about technology surgery and technology in surgery he is pursuing it the same with extreme dedication to that end he has started his phd and hope to be successful in that too with your blessings show the video please practicing at sayog maxillofacial center at thane pachpakad i have started using digital technology in the field of dentistry and maxillofacial surgery since 2017 i was the first to introduce navigational technology in the field of dental implants and maxillofacial surgeries like orthognathic surgery for resection and rehabilitation of resected jaws i also have a copyright for the technique to use dynamic navigation in zygomatic implants zygomatic implants are very relevant today especially post covid where due to mucor infections there were a lot of maxillectomies performed zygomatic implant help us to restore these resected maxilla currently i am pursuing my phd in dynamic navigation and my topic is related to orthognathic surgery this is the first of its kind study where dynamic navigation would be used for the positioning of the upper jaw myself and my wife dr saili we have complete array of digital technology in dentistry and maxillofacial surgery which basically starts from cbct which is data acquisition we have intraoral scanners we have various softwares and we have milling machines as well as 3d printing machines which help us fabricate our prosthesis in house i have also conducted various workshops and trained various dentists all over the world including europe us and india that's wonderful madam it's so heartening that uh, one of our own bachchas has grown up so big that he is he now has uh, something which is you know globally recognized and yes. will have a patent to his name soon so it is very it's a proud moment for us 
because we have seen him grow up in front of us and uh, also um, now he's doing wonderful practice and all the best to him and to you as well thank you yeah uh, i think we have we can conclude now nilima will you please uh, give the vote of thanks hello <laughs> yeah, nilima yeah. yes it was such a wonderful evening we don't we didn't realize how the time flies uh, thank you very much dr vijay neglu sir for a very crisp presentation i think his every slide was important and i am sure every one of us will want to go through the uh, youtube recording later on to grasp the entire lecture again as sir said with new drug coming in uh, the now the approach is person oriented and person centered approach so we have uh, think about that then thank you very much ashwini it was a very nice presentation we all know what is healthy diet and we keep hearing about it but i think ashwini gave us different perspective about healthy eating and she also gave us some practical solutions and options and thank you all the parents for the lovely videos and uh, thank you manisha and uh, dr ashwini for those healthy recipes uh, i thank you thane isa for conducting such a beautiful uh, uh, webinar with a different concept thank you dr manisha uh, manisha ghosh who is the current president of thane isa thank you dr sunil katkade sir who is the founder member founder president and uh, gc member of thane isa thank you dr parna thakkar who is the honorary secretary of thane isa and i thank all the seniors who uh, from sam so all the senior dignitaries dignitaries from sam who attended the webinar thank you so much thank you uh, mr ganesh from jeneka technology thank you everybody and thank you all the uh, members of thane isa and from other branches who attended the webinar thank you before before we leave uh, just one uh, or two announcements nilima one second and thank you amrupali for moderating it so nice thank you uh, just uh, announcements we are having our next webinar on the 14th of december so we will be start uh, giving you information about that soon please attend that also in live numbers and then in the month of january we are having a seminar for ot assistants to make our life better and uh, a well informed ot assistant is always of great help on 14th of january we are having a marathon which is being organized by dr katkade sir and solaris hospital so we will be providing medical support for that and also uh, listening to ashwini after uh, we will go and start exercising from tomorrow so that we are fit to run those kilometers in um, january and then there are many programs which i'm sure all of us will attend dr katkade sir you want to say anything unmute sir unmute kara see this race is on uh, 14th of sunday morning 14th of january sunday morning it will be at godbandar road we are expecting at least a participation of about 1200 to 1500 members the motto of the race marathon half marathon is to make a common people aware uh, a common people aware of the neurological diseases like a spine or a brain diseases they can be very well cured, uh, cured and taken care of so that is a motto of the that is the purpose of this half marathon uh, i request all isa members and the members of thane nsg and medical faculty to participate thank you kindly block your date uh, 14 january sunday morning uh, from 5 am to about 8 39 am thank you thank you very much Surely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, yes. Nilima. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Amrupali. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Good night. Stay safe.